We previously defined the rotational analog of Newton's second law for rigid body rotation about a fixed axis. And using the following kinematic relationship between the angular acceleration and angular velocity, and separating the variables, and integrating both sides of this equation. We have an expression for the angular impulse, or the rotational impulse, is equal to the change in angular momentum on the right hand side. Which for a constant moment of inertia, this evaluates at the following expression. And the following quantity, is known as the spin angular momentum because the rigid body is spinning or rotating about a fixed axis. We can write the rotational analog of Newton's second law for rigid body rotation about a fixed axis in the following form. So on the right hand side we have the instantaneous rate of change of angular momentum with respect to time. And that's equal to the net torque about a perpendicular axis passing through point P. So from this equation, we can obtain a differential definition of the angular impulse, and then integrating both sides of this equation we get back the relationship between the rotational impulse and the change in angular momentum on the right hand side. Where the angular momentum is defined as follows. Recall that the linear momentum of a particle with a mass m is equal to the mass of the particle by the velocity of the particle. And if we define a vector r from an axis passing through point P and perpendicular to the screen to the particle, and we take the cross product on both sides, then we have a relationship between the angular momentum and the linear momentum of the particle, which can be written as follows given the mass of the particle is constant. Now in two dimensions, we can observe that the perpendicular component of the velocity vector contributes to the angular momentum, and the parallel component does not contribute at all. So let's rewrite this expression using the distributive property of the cross product. So this term here is zero, And we can now write this magnitude of the cross product as RV perpendicular. And in two dimensions, this vector is going to point in or out of the plane, so in the z direction. So if we put the tail of the radial vector and the perpendicular velocity vector together, then by the right hand rule, the angular momentum vector is going to point in the screen or we can represent it using the tail of a vector as follows. So therefore we'll put a negative sign here. And this is known as the orbital angular momentum of the particle about the axes passing through point P. A hinged bar with a mass m is subjected to an impulse, which is a constant force over a time t, and we're asked to write an expression for the angular velocity in terms of the following variables, assuming the bar is initially at rest. So recall that the angular impulse momentum equation, where the angular impulse, which consists of the net torque about the hinge, is equal to the change in angular momentum. 
And because the bar is initially at rest, we can get rid of this term. And we can use the scalar components of this equation because we're working in two dimensions. So we know that the torque and angular momentum is going to point in and out of the screen, or in the z direction. So given that the force is constant and applied over a time t, then we simply multiply the force by the moment arm by t to get the angular impulse. And the moment of inertia of the bar about the hinge is ml squared on 3. And that's multiplied by the angular velocity. And now we can solve this for the angular velocity. which is the angular velocity just as the bar begins to take off. A bar with a mass m is resting on a frictionless surface and subjected to an impulse which is a constant force applied over a time t. And we're asked to write an expression for the angular velocity in terms of the following variables. So using the angular impulse momentum equation And because the bar is initially at rest, we can get rid of this term. So here the bar is going to rotate about its center of mass. And the angular impulse is simply the force by the moment arm multiplied by t. And the moment of inertia about the center of mass is ml squared on 12. And now we can solve for the angular velocity. which is the angular velocity of the bar just as it begins to rotate. We have a general case where a rigid body is free to translate and rotate and we take the torque about a point other than the center of mass. So the angular impulse as we've derived previously is equal to the change in angular momentum. And in this case, because the body can translate and rotate, we can split this up into the spin angular momentum plus the orbital angular momentum. So effectively, the rigid body is free, so it's going to spin or rotate about its center of mass. So this is the spin angular momentum term. And due to the linear momentum of the center of mass, the rigid body is also going to orbit around P. So this is the orbital angular momentum, which is a cross product between a radial vector from C to P, and the linear momentum vector. Now if the net torque about P is zero, so for example, we had forces acting on the body, where well, the line of action of the forces passes through P, then we obtain the following expression for the change in angular momentum. And therefore we can write the initial angular momentum on the left hand side is equal to the final angular momentum on the right hand side. Well, angular momentum is conserved if the net torque about the given point is zero. Recall that the conservation of angular momentum states that the initial angular momentum of rigid body is equal to the final angular momentum of the body. And the condition for this to hold was that the net torque acting on the body about a particular point is zero. So the conservation of angular momentum can be extended to a system of particles and rigid bodies. So here if we take the system as a bullet and a ballistic pendulum, 
And in this initial configuration, the bullet has a linear momentum, and we have a force of weight acting through the center of mass of this pendulum. Then a good point to take the torque about is the hinge, because the net torque acting on this system is then zero. And we can apply the conservation of angular momentum to the system. So this here gives the total momentum of the system in the initial configuration. And in the final configuration, the bullet impacts this pendulum. Well, we can observe that by Newton's third law, that the bullet exerts a force on this mass, and the mass exerts an equal and opposite force on the bullet. And given the force of weight of the pendulum, the net torque for this system about point P is still zero. So we can still apply the conservation of angular momentum to this problem. And similarly, if we have a disc impacting another disc, so in the initial configuration, we have the initial angular momentum and no torques acting on this system. And in the final configuration, we have equal and opposite forces acting between these disks. So therefore the net torque about any point that we choose is zero. And we can thereby apply the conservation of angular momentum to this type of problem also. So in the final configuration, the disks can move off at different velocities. And when we consider their rotations, they can also acquire angular velocities. A bullet is fired into an impact testing assembly. And the bullet, bar and disks have the following masses. And we're asked to determine the angular velocity of the assembly. So if we take the bullet and the pendulum as a system, then we can take the torque about this hinge. Because the lines of action of the forces of weight of the components in this system all pass through this point, and therefore there's no external torque acting on the system, so angular momentum will be conserved. So therefore the orbital angular momentum of the bullet which is the linear momentum of the bullet by the moment arm from the pivot. And that's converted into a spin angular momentum of the assembly, which spins about this pivot. So at this point, the bullet is embedded into this mass. So therefore, the moment of inertia of the assembly about the pivot after impact can be written as follows. So for the bullet, and for the disks, which are treated as point masses, because we're not given their geometry, and plus the moment of inertia of the bar about the pivot which can be written as the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the parallel axis term. And simplifying this expression, you can solve for the angular velocity of the system.